Um, I'd like to officially welcome everyone to the IMARC Mets Arena Live. Um, this is episode two and the topic and the, uh, I guess the theme for today's uh, conversation is around the topic of resources. Um, this monthly series is in partnership with Global Victoria and also the resources team at the Department of Jobs, Precincts and Regions uh, for the uh, Government of Victoria. Uh, we welcome Natalia uh, Garano, um, who's joining us uh, from Santiago and leads the, uh, the Global Victoria team. I also welcome and thank our technical partners, Mining Plus, um, whom today will be represented by Andrew Fowler, um, that you'll see on the screen. He'll be asking a number of questions to our METS companies, as well as uh, providing some uh, technical information uh, to the, uh, the audience around this particular topic. So thank you to Mining Plus for their support, as well as Global Victoria. Um, and we uh, are looking forward to uh, many more episodes uh, with you guys uh, together. IMARC, as many of you know, um, is founded in collaboration with OzIMM, Ostmine, um, the Victorian Government and Mines and Money. Um, in the lead up uh, to IMARC um, and uh, to engage and connect industry uh, whilst promoting the capabilities of pre-qualified METS companies, um, this series has been launched. Uh, we're looking to host one a month until um, November, December this year, at which time then the live IMARC event will be running. Now, when we say live, it may be a bit of an online show, but uh, either way, IMARC 2020 will be going ahead and we will provide you guys some information about that. The whole purpose of this particular episode and all the episodes like it is to allow a miner or otherwise a mining contractor to talk about an industry challenge or otherwise a company challenge and then allow five METS companies to provide solutions to that particular problem. These five METS companies that have um, selected here today and we'll see them all on the screen. We've got uh, Chris Beal from Next All, we've got Brenton Crawford from um, Solution, uh, Sol Geo Solutions. Um, Heath Arvinson from K2 Fly, we've got Steve Law from Sequent, and uh, there's his face, David Scholar from um, Southern Innovation joining us today. All these METS companies were um, selected by both Mining Plus as well as um, the Global Victoria and uh, Victorian Government team. However, the star attraction obviously of these episodes is usually our miner, so I'd like to also um, shout out to Diego Ariagaraga. Um, from the Haldon and Mining Company, who's also joining us from Santiago. Um, he's given us a bit of advice that if we do see his kids joining the screen to say hi to them, but uh, he sends his apologies if that does happen, but we're absolutely fine if it does. So we'll hear from Diego a little bit later on. In the meantime, as always, um, if you have a question during the Q&A period, um, please do let us know via the chat and we will unmute you so then you can ask the question directly to the audience. Turn on your cameras um, and do please feel free to make this as interactive as possible because that's the whole purpose and we really do want to uh, find out the best solutions uh, for this particular challenge and problem. Without further ado, I'll kick off to Natalia and um, hear a few words about what's going on with Global Victoria, especially there in Latin America. Thanks, Natalia. Terrific. Terrific. Thank you very much, Shireen. Um, so my name is Natalia Gorroño. I'm the Victorian Government's Senior Trade and Investment Director for Latin America. My team and I are based in Chile, um, one of the region's key mining countries, and we're delighted to be able to support um, the iMike Mets Arena series. For those of you that are unfamiliar with the role that the Victorian government's international offices play, we're here to do three things, especially the Santiago office. So we help Victorian exporters do business and reach clients overseas. We help attract foreign investment into Victoria. And in Santiago, we also work in education, which means positioning Victoria's education sector and attracting more international students um, to the state. Um, mining is obviously a major industry in Chile and Latin America, and it's one of the key industries that my team and I focus on. In practice, this means that we help connect miners, engineering companies and contractors with um, Victoria's amazing METS um, companies to help solve industry problems and explore um, new ways of doing things. We do this on the ground across Latin America. So our office covers everything from Mexico right down to Patagonia. Um, and we also do it by leveraging um, events like IMARC as a key forum to help connect these stakeholders. So a big shout out to Shireen, Paul, Anita and the team. It's always a pleasure to team up with you. 
Um, we're really proud of our track record supporting Victorian METS companies um, in Latin America. So we work with companies including Duratre, Orica, Corlon, um, Swan Global, Medeco and many others. And I'd like to use this opportunity to invite any Victorian METS exporters that are thinking of Latin America to reach out to me. We're here to help. I'd also like to extend a very special welcome and thank you like Shireen did to Diego eh, Arrigorriada from the Haldeman Mining Company. Diego, muchas gracias for accepting our invitation to participate in the guest miner as the guest mi miner in this session. And I hope that this will be the first step to many more um, to working together and finding solutions to the problems that the mining industry faces in Chile. So without further ado, I'll um, hand over to Shireen and to you. Excellent. Thank you, Natalia, and thank you for your support. Natalia um, is also the one that helped us get Diego um, dialing in as well. So we're really, really uh, thankful and excited to have uh, the Global Victoria Latin America team working with us. Um, talking about Diego, uh, I think we'll kick off and, and, and allow Diego to talk a little bit about the, um, the challenges and the project that uh, they have there at Haldeman. Diego. Great. Thank you so much. And. Um... Thanks, uh, Shireen, and thanks, Natalia, for the invitation. I, I am really excited to be part of this uh, experiment. And uh, thanks to everyone uh, connected to, to this conference for listening to what I have to say. So I, I, don't, I don't know if you're looking at the presentation. Oh, there it is. OK, so I, I will tell you first uh, a little bit about the company. Uh, Haldeman uh, started in the early 2000s. Uh, when uh, a group of employees uh, set up a fund and uh, bought uh, a mining company that didn't have any mining resources, uh, uh, all of its mining resources were already depleted. Mm -hmm. And they also bought uh, a, a mining project in the north of Chile. So they took the plant, the solvent extraction plant, from the, the project that uh, was uh, already depleted and uh, took all those assets and brought it to uh, the new project up in the north. And um, all those employees uh, work in a, in, in a company that is very uh, important for, for, for the Chilean uh, mining environment that was Minera Pudahuel. Uh, many, maybe some of you uh, knew that company that uh, it, it was the first SXEW plant in the country. And uh, our DNA is, uh, is a medium scale miner. We really like the profits and the sales from uh, medium scale mining. Uh, uh, we operate uh, today an underground gold mine uh, and the copper uh, uh, mine, both in northern Chile, uh, separated by around, I don't know, 1500, uh, uh, sorry. 15, ah, sorry, 1,500 uh, kilometers uh, apart. And uh, we have a tradition of uh, giving second life to old plants. I already told you of the first uh, example from the Puda Well assets, and uh, later I will tell you the second uh, case that we have is the Mitilla plant. Uh, and we are very much growth oriented. Uh, we're very lucky, our shareholders, uh, they, they don't focus, uh, focus that much in dividends, they focus in growth. Uh, we, Besides those two operational companies, we have one brownfield project in pipeline, and the, our objective is to double our revenues in the next five years. So let me tell you a bit about Mitilla. And the Mitilla uh, is a company we bought from Antofagasta Minerals uh, back in 2016. Uh, it was uh, too small for Antofagasta Minerals, but it's actually the perfect size for us. And the, the process for Mitilla is, uh, is the, the classical uh, copper oxides to uh, copper cathodes uh, process uh, with crushing lixiviation with sulfuric acid, solvent extraction, and electrowinning. Uh, it has a, a plant capacity of uh, 50,000 tons uh, of copper cathodes per annum. Uh, and uh, we are now operating only half of it. So, uh, we uh, still have 25,000 tons per annum of copper cathodes capacity, capacity to be used, okay? And the, what you see in that image is uh, a radius of around 10 kilometers uh, from the plant. Uh, and uh, the reason why, I, why I, I am showing you that image is that uh, basically uh, all of the, the ore bodies that are included in that, uh, in that radius 
uh, were already uh, exploited by antifagast animals. Uh, there are dozens of uh, medium to small ore bodies. Uh, and as you will see in, in the following image, there are uh, much more to be uh, exploded. Sorry, I, I, I need to go back to the last one. Sorry for that. Um, and uh, also, uh, as, uh, we use seawater. So uh, water is not a problem, uh, as uh, our water footprint is not a problem as well. Sorry for that. We can go to the following one. So what's the challenge? And I'm sure that this, this is not a new thing for you. This is like the holy grail of uh, mining. All right, uh, and the, our biggest challenge is to break the distance barrier. So you see in this image, uh, again, the same radius and the, in the yellow squares, you see all our mining property. So you see that around one third of our mining property uh, is already, already depleted. And we have two thirds uh, that are in a very good neighborhood. This is the Antofagasta region. And the, all the, 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 um, the yellow hammers are mining operations. So around Calama, you have uh, a big chunk of the Codelco operations. Uh, there at the bottom right, uh, you have uh, the Escondida and the Saldivar. And uh, right around the middle, you have the Sentinela from Antofagasta Minerals and the Antucoya. So it's, it's an extremely uh, uh, good neighborhood. And uh, we have a lot of mining uh, 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 rights, uh, as you see in, the, in, in those yellow small squares. Uh, and uh, we have already identified uh, around half a dozen uh, new ore bodies that are outside of that radius. And uh, the problem we have is that the, with, the, with the existing technology, it's not profitable to operate uh, those ore bodies. Uh, so we have uh, explored already uh, two different lines of work. First, to reduce the amount of material uh, to move. And for that, we, uh, we are already trying, we, we, we're already operating an uh, automated or sorting uh, technology. Uh, there we are uh, in the ramp up uh, phase. Uh, it will be fully operational during 2021. And we're increasing the grade uh, around three times in reducing our material to move to around one third. And uh, what we already, uh, we, we have looked at, but, but, but not too, too seriously, I have to say, is a rail bayer technology, which is a, a mixture between rail and the conveyor belts uh, that we saw uh, operational once in a mining uh, uh, project. And uh, uh, having a, a separate crushing and lixiviation uh, plant uh, located close to the ore bodies, then transporting solutions, which is something that is done uh, in Sentinella that is very close to our operation. So we already saw that example. So that's, what, that's the challenge. That's what we are already doing and uh, what we have looked at. And uh, we haven't solved the problem at all. Uh, and the, the, the field is open for us to see what you have to offer and to try new technologies. We really love to try new, new technologies, as you can see from, from the ore sorting project. And um, basically that, I'm really open to hear what you have to say. Okay, excellent. Thank you, Diego. Um, Andrew, I think we'll kick off with our, um, our first uh, METS company and, um, and, and see what, uh, what we've got in store. But do you have any comments about Diego's project or his challenge uh, at this first stance, Andrew? Yeah, uh, hi Diego. Um, I guess to start off with, as to set a bit of a context for the discussion, is there any um, uh, social implications or constraints in terms of what you're trying to achieve there. Um, it seems like you, you want to build um, transportation corridors or, or railways or possibly pipelines. What are the restrictions that are applied by government or perhaps by community groups that we need to consider in, that, in those regards? Well, uh, the closest community to our mining operation is around 10 kilometers in distance. And uh, there might, must, must be around 
200 people living there. And uh, we're basically in the middle of the desert. And, uh, and uh, we, we, we don't foresee any social issues uh, because basically there are very few people living around. And, uh, and they live out of uh, mining as well. So they understand the business. Okay. Chris Beal from Nextdoor, um, if you'd like to uh, kick off your presentation. Sure, happy to. I should um, pre-start this uh, as we get your presentation up from Elaine. Um, Nextdoor actually featured at iMark about two or three years ago in one of our uh, pitch battles and, and won that challenge. So it's great to have you back here, Chris. Glad to be back. And uh, the, the very quick format is, uh, is getting to be pretty familiar. So I'll, I'll cruise through this, and the, the first thing to say is that it's it's good to hear that you're you're already looking at um, sorting solutions at your operations, and so you're already familiar with what this first slide will be about. Uh, effectively, as grades decline in ore bodies, uh, there is often this this uh, phenomenon of uh, the, the mineralization being actually separated by more and more waste material. And so effectively, ore sorting is the intention of being able to efficiently identify those waste material sections or pods or packets, as many different companies call them, uh, and then remove them before you get to your further processes downstream. So uh, obviously the fact that you're, you're looking at reducing volumes before you go to a trucking stage that's the intention for us as well. So that's what we've been helping companies with uh, over the past couple of years. Nextdoor is a fairly new company. We began in 2017. Uh, but if you'll hit it to the next slide, we've been focusing on delivering bulk ore sorting solutions to mining companies. So uh, as opposed to particle sorting systems, which will crush and then identify and separate in each individual rock, what we focus on is uh, enabling that kind of sorting activity to go on at much higher throughput rates by installing yes. analyzers on high throughput conveyor belts, being able to very accurately and very efficiently identify the high and low grade pods within, within that material, and then being able to remove the waste pods uh, in an automated system. Now, the map shows where we've done this around the world. Copper is our main focus at these early stages, although the technology is also applicable for uh, gold deposits, iron ore, cobalt, a number of other applications, but cores, or copper is our main focus initially. And on belt is, is certainly our initial focus as well. Although we also have projects with some of some global miners to take this technology and actually apply it in the mining pit itself on mobile machinery. And if you'll head to the next slide, uh, the, the key to all of this for us is the magnetic resonance technology, which is a new technology for the mining space. It was developed by Australia's CSIRO, uh, and it's, like I said, new to the mining space, but it's been used extensively in things like medical science. So the MR, or magnetic resonance, is the same MR as you would see in an MRI machine in a medical application. In mining, uh, what it is is... Uh, a radio technology that allows you to carry out mineral detection uh, in a specified set of minerals. So that's what we were talking about earlier. What, what's the mineralogy of your site? That's something that's critical for the application of this technology. But where mineralogy is applicable in terms of alternative technologies, this is the fastest and most accurate uh, sensing method that exists for, uh, for bulk applications. And that's something that we've proven in the field. Uh, it's a radio technology, which is quite critical because it has no ionizing radiation. You don't have to have a uh, nuclear source or a neutron generator, which also means that it can be moved around more easily into different applications around the mine site. Uh, notably, we have, uh, amongst the projects that have gone out all over the world, never had to recalibrate a single analyzer, regardless of its operation between different host rocks uh, or, or um, different mines themselves, uh, and it's being adopted quite rapidly around the world. So the, the crux of it is that this is very suitable for um, high throughput operations particularly, uh, but it's one of many different sensing types and uh, others like 
Southern Innovation also have sensors, as I know it. XRT is the one of theirs. Uh, there are PGNA sensors. So the trick with sensor-based sorting is is always to get the one that's most mm. suitable for your operation. Thanks, Chris. Andrew. Thanks for that, Chris. Um, I got a, a few questions and um, and interested to hear your your observations, but. Uh, what is the approximate capital cost of installing a product uh, like an online sensor and uh, the payback period? And do you have any examples of um, some customers where they've actually paid it off already? Uh, Shireen, I don't know if we can pull that presentation back up again, but um, the, the cost of these systems is not, a, it's dominated by the fixed infrastructure that surrounds the sensors themselves. It's that the sensor forms a very small component of that. And in fact, we provide our sensors on a least cost basis so that you don't have a big capital cost associated with the sensor when you start going. Uh, so if you just go to slide two there. So the trick with that is that obviously as you go to different throughput rates, uh, the scale of the equipment changes dramatically. So if you see the Mexican unit in the middle on the right there, uh, the, the cost of that infrastructure, because it was a combination of mobile equipment and our own sensor and a bit of fixed conveyor belt with a diverter gate on the end. Uh, that capital cost for that equipment was, as I understand it, to be about $300,000. So it's pretty low, albeit that's at a throughput rate of about 1.6 million ton per annum. Now, if you look at an operation that's in the 10 million ton per annum, then obviously your capital cost is gonna increase quite a bit to go to that. Uh, now, the, the beauty of this system is that it is very simple, as you see in, in that middle shot. Uh, it's effectively a crusher, a conveyor, the sensor, and a diverter gate. And that's all you need to do bulk ore sorting. So it can be quite compact. And the capital cost to do that is a lot less than, you know, maybe a particle sorter of equivalent size would need many screens, many conveyors, crushers, secondary crushers, uh, and, and quite a complex system. So where bulk ore sorting has an advantage is definitely at the higher throughput uh, range and also where you need to have a simplified arrangement. So the beauty of a system like this is also that it might be applicable for an underground uh, setting as well. Um, you mentioned um, uh, you, you start, currently you have an on-belt solution, but you mentioned that there could possibly be a on-bucket solution in the future. Um, do you think that an on-belt or an on-bucket solution would have more impact on value adding for a large-scale mining operation? My, my feeling with the work that we've done with companies is that the on-belt system is the highest value proposition, but it's also the highest complexity. So you're able to sort at the smallest resolution size possible. At, at that operation that we were talking about, you sort on about 150 kilos at a time of material and the decision is made whether to keep or reject that. At higher throughput operations, we typically look at about a ton or two tons at a time. Uh, but that obviously requires the fixed infrastructure, a feasibility project to put that in place, the construction of that, and it takes time and it takes quite a bit of effort to do so. And obviously you need to do the testing and the proving up that goes on before that. Uh, in terms of mobile solutions, where you're able to sort on the basis of, say, one truck at a time and actually accurately um, assign those trucks to either waste or low grade or ore, that's still a very valuable proposition and still is in the order of, you know, changing recovery from the mine by about 10 percent, as we've shown, or sorry, we've, we've proven in other applications. But... Uh, it's a lot easier to go ahead with that because you're not having to change the actual fixed infrastructure of the asset. So being able to bolt that onto an existing operation is a simpler process, albeit in our opinion, has a tendency to give you a lower value. And there's no reason why you can't be able to use both systems together in a way that pulls the best benefits from both. And that goes for you know, mobile versus fixed, but it also goes for bulk sorting and particle sorting. There's no reason why you can't involve both different systems to get a better outcome than one of them individually. And we're quite happy to work with others on that kind of project. Um, I'll step in there just quickly. I um, have uh, Christian from uh, Cadelco uh, calling in and, and, and asking, 
to ask a question to you, Chris. So, Christian, um, you, you're unmuted. Yep. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Good day, everyone. Just, I'm just trying to understand the, the technology behind the next door sensor. I'm just wondering if you actually uh, give a percentage of the different minerals that are going to the conveyor, or it's just the grades of each metal, you know, and 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 how kind of a uh, how is the accuracy? I mean, if it's a machine learning model that is in the background or is actually uh, something a bit simpler, you know, I mean, that's what. Hmm? Uh, we, we give a mineralogical content measurement. So what we actually produce from the analyzer system is uh, the kilos or tons of the mineral that we're targeting. So for example, if it's chalk pyrite, we'll be saying there is 100 kilos of chalk pyrite in the pod that's been measured. That's compared against, on a conveyor system, a weightometer, which gives you the grade. Uh, so it is a direct measurement system, and it's fully penetrative. So this is, this is not surface mineralogy. This is the mineral content of the full load of material as it proceeds past. And the accuracy of, accuracy of it is very high. So uh, we've proven in the field that we're capable of achieving uh, a for chalco pyrite, and it does vary mineral to min mineral, but for chalco pyrite, uh, accuracy of plus or minus 0 0.023 percent copper in a two second measurement interval. Okay, we're going to have to um, get on to the, the next speaker, Chris. There are two more questions in the group chat that you'll see, um, or three that's just popped up that you might want to answer, but in the meantime, um, if it's okay, Andrew, we're going to move on to David's presentation. David? Good morning and good evening, everybody. And, uh, and Shireen, thank you very much for um, arranging for uh, this particular webinar. Uh, it's a great opportunity. Um, here at Southern Innovation, you know, much like uh, Chris mentioned, um, the, the genesis for our technology is based in science. Um, and whilst everybody would like these things to happen quickly, um, this was a, a PhD study at the back end of the, of the 1990s and early 2000s, um, looking at a really difficult scanning problem. Um, you know, there's a, a whole range of difficult scanning problems across industries, but in this case, it was humanitarian demining was the focus um, of, of the core of our technology. And ultimately, in that set of scenario, what you want to do is to perform your scanning really quickly, really accurately, so no false positives and no false negatives, um, and in a very, very safe fashion. So um, Chris talked about um, isotopic versus switchable sources and things of that nature. Ideally, you want a situation where um, you don't have a source of radiation which is emitting all the time. Um, and if you if you change slides, what's happened in the in the sort of preceding 18 years is um, the, the subject matter of the PhD was was not so much about a particular type of radiation, but more about how you efficiently process the information coming out of any given radiation detector. So whether you're detecting you know, gamma rays in a, in a neutron activated event, um, whether you're looking at X-ray fluorescence, um, which many people will be familiar with is a, is a core part of some particle sorting techniques as is X-ray transmission, um, or whether you're looking at LIBS or nuclear magnetic resonance imaging or things of that nature. What you wanna do is to be able to process the information much more quickly. And so we've developed that um, initially in synchrotron science where we've taken processing rates from 100,000 counts of, of incident x-rays per second to 7 million counts per second and accurately processing that information. So we started in, in synchrotron science and we're, and we're the um, signal processing of preference worldwide in synchrotron science now. Uh, we moved into aviation security scanning. Uh, that was in sort of 2013 through 2016 period of time. Um, and we were bought out of that, that particular opportunity by our joint venture partner. And in 2015, so around a similar sort of time to, to Nextdoor, we moved into the resources sector. And there you can see um, that, that our mining products aim to have continuous, real-time, 100% of the stream analysis. Um, and that's the, the X-ray transmission product that, that Chris referred to. Now, if you, if you change slides, please, um, you'll see in mining what we've done is like next door, we've applied that X-ray transmission capability to a product that we call grade scan, which is conveyor mounted. 
Um, and, and the bulk sorting opportunity there um, in, in bulk commodities uh, is enormous. So in a, in a coking coal application, so metallurgical coal application in the Bowen Basin, uh, we did a hypothetical business case and said, even if the total all up cost of, of installing this unit was say 10 million US dollars and, and it's not, um, but even if it were, what would the payback period be for that particular mining operation? Uh, and we did the analysis and the payback period for that mining operation was 28 days on a $10 million investment. And that's because as, as, as Chris pointed out and as Diego pointed out, the, the value in use from bulk sorting applications, whether it's bulk sorting of bulk commodities or whether it's bulk sorting of base or precious metals um, is enormous and, and it gets bigger um, the, the smaller the representation of resource of interest on the belt is. So the faster that you can remove waste from the process as early to the mine face as possible, the higher the capital return uh, on your investment. Now, the other application that we have is real-time continuous feedback on exploration drilling. So that drill scan unit that you can see in the centre there and, and, and in my background behind me um, is an X-ray transmission unit that we've developed with um, the support of BHP uh, to analyse iron ore in real time in the Pilbara and give you real time grade uh, as that ore is coming out of the ground. Now that's clearly very, very valuable in use because um, the geologist either locally or via uh, remote operations at a, at a remote operations centre in, in Brisbane or in, in Perth can make a decision about whether that drilling contractor continues to drill uh, or whether that drilling contractor elects to abandon that hole and move on to the next hole. Um, th and that contrasts with typical operations in the past where you gather samples from that hole, um, analyse those samples remotely at a, at a lab in Perth uh, and then decide on, on whether to revisit that hole or not. Now, if, if you just go back a slide for a second, the, the point um, that we make, and, and here it's a little obscured by the video, but that Falcon X unit is our, is our synchrotron signal processing unit, but to the extreme right um, is, a, is a collaboration that we have with a neutron gamma scanning company um, that is installed at a copper mine in, in Chile. Um, and Diego, you'd be well aware it's not your mine, um, but it is installed at a copper mine in Chile. And there we're using traditional neutron gamma techniques but we're massively increasing the speed of analysis. So historically, the speed of analysis for neutron gamma has been measured in minutes, um, albeit there's a number of very, very good OEMs out there who update their, uh, their information on a, on a 15 or 20 second basis. It, it takes minutes to get the actual analysis for decision making. Um, and in this application, what we've done is we've taken the analysis time from well in excess of three minutes down to less than 20 seconds on belt. Now that's still a longer analysis time in neutron based applications than in X-ray transmission, where even if the belt's moving at four meters a second, we'll give you sub meter resolution. Um, but it comes back to, to Chris's point on, you know, horses for courses or different techniques for different mineral applications. Um, and what we're able to do working collaboratively with, with mining houses such as yours, Diego, and, and many others, we, we have um, quite a large number of, um, of collaborators in the mining industry from BHP, as I'd already mentioned, to Anglo and Newcrest and many others, um, is look at the particular problem and then on, a, on an agnostic basis, work um, either with our suite of products or with existing manufacturers uh, to determine whether we're able to offer significant value in use um, by applying existing techniques or novel techniques, but in an accelerated way, which is why our core technology, which we call Cytoro, has the tagline accelerated analysis because that's what we offer to industry. David, we might stop you there and get a question in from, uh, from Andrew, and then we've got one from the audience as well. Andrew. Thanks. Thanks for that, David. It's very uh, informative. Um, I've got a bit of a general question for you. Um, a lot of what you do seems to be very new and innovative. And um, 
I was wondering when you're introducing um, new technology or solutions, there's a bit of a trust factor to overcome and how have you managed that with um, your customers? Um, look, we, we find the best way to do it is to open book it, right? We, we um, are much more open than um, historically companies like ours has been the case in terms of what drives our core IP. Now, um, with some companies, they're able to either engage existing employees or, or um, you know, third party experts who are, who are objective to, to assess our claims. And we find that as people assess those claims in more detail um, and build trust in the veracity of what it is that we're saying, um, then you build trust in a relationship over time and it makes collaboration easier. Um, the other thing that we do is that we're, we're quite selective in the opportunities that we pursue. Um, we, don't, we don't make any money from, from the collaboration itself. Um, we, we, we seek to recover costs, but we don't make any money from it. We make money from selling product. And so if a particular application is not something that we can create value in, then we'll be very open with our, with our mining customers and say, listen, you know, this is not an area where the application of our technology is, is going to create significant value for, for you. So, so let's move on or let's, let's revisit it when we can prove up that it does. We've got a question, Andrew, uh, from Joe Kakuza uh, for, for David. Joe? Oh, hello, David. Thanks for your presentation. Um, besides mining, there's uh, an enormous market out there for sorting e-waste and indeed hard domestic waste. Um, has your technology been applied to this, uh, this challenge? And indeed, this is a question probably for the previous speaker as well. Thanks, Joe. I, I, um, I deliberately limited our slides to, um, to mining applications and a little bit of history on, on where we came from. But your question is a very good one. Yes, is the answer. Um, there's some really uh, previously intractable uh, issues in, in um, recycling of waste um, that we're applying our technology to. And, and one example of that um, is glass recycling. So in glass recycling, you may or may not be aware that often there's, there's um, metals and, and in particular heavy metals and, and ceramic glasses that, that can corrupt entire truckloads of recycled glass and, and make, it, make them useless. Um, and often you're looking for really, really small nickel fragments or tungsten fragments or you know, bits of aluminium in, in um, tons and tons and tons of glass. So that is a live opportunity that we're pursuing at the moment, yes. Um, also, um, scrap metal sorting, um, both to reduce the penalties that you pay when you, when you get to the end of that process and, and you dump what's called the zorba um, into, into landfill. There's significant penalties for having metal still in that zorba, uh, but there's significant revenue opportunity from extracting the metal from that zorba. So we're pursuing all of those opportunities. Um, it's fair to say that our core focus at the moment, however, um, is our mining products. If anyone has further questions for David, you can obviously speak to him via the group chat uh, for everyone to see those questions. Andrew, if it's okay, we might kick on to um, Steve's presentation from Sequent and uh, come back to you for any questions for David after. Excellent, thank you, David. Steve Law from Sequent, um, your presentation, please. Uh, next slide, thank you. Good morning, everybody. Sequent develops powerful geoscience analysis, modeling, and collaborative technologies. Our solutions enable people to uncover valuable insights from data, manage risk, and make better decisions about earth, environment, and energy challenges. Our software includes the LeapFrog suite for geology modeling and resource estimation, the Geosoft suite for geophysics capability, and the GeoStudio suite for geotechnical applications. Sequence Central is a cloud-based model management system providing added collaboration and version control tools to enhance the desktop solutions. We provide interoperability with numerous partner companies such as Index Limited, Deswick, and All Blasting Consultants. This allows added flexibility across the entire mining, civil, and environmental value chains. Our solutions are targeted at understanding your resource before and during the mining process. We have a global team of technical and support people, including an office located in Santiago. Next slide, please. 
solving the problem proposed by the Haldeman Mining Company could be achieved by addressing four key criteria. Communication with data from multiple sources or projects stored centrally in a single location and consistently accessible no matter where the stakeholders are. It allows for transparency of data and this facilitates the breakdown of barriers and provides the team with the opportunity to work collaboratively and learn what has changed and why it has changed over time. Time efficiency, with dynamic updating and linking of models, it reduces the time frame between receiving new data and having to eat available for planning decisions. The standardization of workflows leads to the removal of redundancies and improves the team's efficiency. Quality assurance, changes made to models attract and an auditable record is maintained. Allocated administrators control user access to provide data security. Teams separated by distance can collaborate online in real time within the software and records of changes are kept. Integration, uh, this follows into the next slide, please. So a specific practical application to address the situation could be using the sequence central management solution in concert with LeapFrog Geo and LeapFrog Edge desktop applications. This enables the geology team to maintain dynamic, up-to-date geological models directly linked to the grade control resource models. New data and geological knowledge can be applied even on a daily basis and used to ensure mining process efficiencies. Combined with this, the outputs can be shared with partner solutions such as Orpo 3D. This software solution lets open pit production geologists produce optimised or controlled polygons to achieve highest value whilst main minimising dilution and or loss. Sequence solutions provide the standard platforms in both desktop and cloud environments, but provide flexibility to develop workflows that best optimise the modelling requirements for each customer. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Andrew, do we have some questions for Steve? Yes. Uh, how's it going, Steve? Thanks. Good, thanks. Um, it's no secret that I'm a big fan of uh, LeapFrog. And, uh, well, I think uh, introducing implicit modelling was a step change in the way that we do resource geology that um, came out with LeapFrog initially. Does Sequent have plans to introduce any other tools that could fundamentally change the way that we do our work? The, the focus going forward for us is enhancing the um, opportunities of sort of branching into central, so from different out inputs, or, and also being able to get our information out as well. So um, I know there's a lot of work looking towards the actual production and geology environment. And so we, at the moment, we'll do all our resource modeling inside the software, and as we know, models are getting bigger and bigger, taking longer to process. So um, we'll be investigating, trying to take the processing off the desktop, but still have all your um, data available back in the software once it's finished processing. And any other partners, so if we have geostatistical solutions we may not have now, but someone else has developed, if we'll open up our API and let them talk to our systems. Okay, so collaboration is uh, important for you guys. Yes, so it's very important yeah. for us going forward. Um, I guess it's, it seems from an as outsider's point of view that um, Sequent has a culture of innovation. How does, um, how does your company establish and maintain that culture of innovation? I think it's um, partly we've got, we've got a, it's, even though it's, it's globally spread, it's still, it's almost thought of like as a family company within. So they're always looking for people with a lot of, um, uh, what's the word, are very interested in the future and looking always outside the box. And um, I mean, we've still got all, a lot of the people who developed Leaf Frog right at the beginning. So all those types of minds that are thinking outside the box. And uh, that is still very much a sort of masthead of how the whole company tries to work, but also communicating with each other. So if someone comes up with a great idea in South America, you know, it's shared across the world and we all try and participate. 
Excellent. Um, just a bit more detail probably would be good um, relating to the problem statement. Um, uh, I saw mention of a tool for grade control, um, possibly related to large open pits. Could you talk a bit more about that tool and how it could be related to our problem statement? So this was, um, I think, All Pro 3D. The it's basically a blast movement. It it generates the all polygons, but it's after the movement. So it takes into account the blasting pattern, and you need the post topography survey. But it takes into account then the post blast topography and fluid dynamics um, algorithms um, to say this is how the rock has moved. And you've got your pre resource and it moves the actual resource and then it makes the polygons so it can allow for vertical movement within the blast not just lateral movement as what tends to be the way things are done these days and it's quite a quick process minutes and uh, and it shoots the outputs directly to um, Wenco systems and other um, whatever the systems that the people driving the equipment are using it can get that output directly to them it's, uh, thanks. And it's thanks, very Steve. interactive. <laughs> thanks, Steve. Thank you. Um, Heath uh, is, our, is our next speaker from K2Fly. Heath, if you were um, keen to go now. Okay. <clears throat> thanks, Shireen. Well, the Prezo is coming up. A bit of background on me. I'm a mining and resource geologist. Uh, about 30 years experience now. I've joined K2Fly earlier this year. Um, really driven by the acquisition of R-cubed. Uh, last year from uh, South Africa. Uh, that K2Fly is a young publicly listed software company. Its focus is on um, ESG on the one side with the InfoScope solution, but also mineral resource and reserve reporting through the R-Cube solution. Um, I'll talk a bit more about that as we go through. What I really want to talk about today that I think is quite relevant to the to the problem that Diego has outlined is um, is discussed on the next slide. Thanks. So today, R cubed is is really focused on reporting of resource and reserves, and obviously, governance of resources and reserves is really important to make sure that uh, we get what we plan to get, and we're going to extend the solution to include reconciliation, and obviously. The best way to validate that your resource and reserve is accurate is to measure what's going on through your value chain. I think in this particular example, um, that's really important, particularly if you are going to add processes like ore sorting or scanning technology. Some, in some cases, you won't actually have underlying geometallurgical models that, that provide a good prediction of the outcome of that. So reconciliation is a way to build up a database over time. What we're conceiving for R-Cubed is really based on Harry Parker's, um, I would say, almost famous model of reconciliation, which is the F1, F2, F3 approach. Um, it, it connects all control practices with all reserves. So some of the stuff that uh, um, uh, we just heard from Sequin in the all control space, comparing that to the all reserve to see how they, how they compare. Um, also comparing what's received at the mill versus what the mine said it delivered. You can often learn a lot by that comparison. And obviously comparing your reserve to what comes out of the mill is a final validation of, of your ore reserve. But there's many people doing reconciliation. A lot of people use that Parker model. Um, a lot of other people extend that to other nodes in the mine value chain, I would, I would say, um, to learn more about what's going on to make the whole process transparent. But I don't see many people uh, in my travels actually applying good governance over reconciliation. And I think that's the distinguishing factor with RQ is that you can now put some controls in, in place about how the data's captured, who's doing what in the process and making the results available through online dashboards across the business. So there's a technical assurance aspect solution that um, probably preaching to innovation can identify opportunities to improve your efficiency and mining. And there's just one more slide just to show who our customers are. So this uh, 
development and reconciliation is being driven by, by our customers. Most of our customers understand the value from reconciliation and want to build that into to our cube. They understand the governance, the value of having governance over that as well. Thanks. Thanks, Heath. Um, Andrew? Thanks for that, Heath. Um, you're in my comfort zone now. I have a bit of experience with reconciliation and uh, trying to create a, a system to bring all of those pieces of information together. Um, I found that that was the biggest challenge is that you'd have all these different silos and databases, houses, all different places in the operation. Have you, how, how do you go about bringing that information together and, and working with each of the different customers and stakeholders? You there? <laughs> so, so one of the great things about the tasks are uh, automated, if you like, there's a monthly process. Uh, the person who needs to collect a particular type of data is notified that they have to supply that data and they load it into the system and then it's available for everyone to see and work with. So in a way that breaks, breaks the silos, you don't need so much direct communication between people because they're all working through the same system. Um, what I would see is a really valuable tool or, or part of a reconciliation system would be built-in validation steps. Um, have you considered that and, and do you have that as part of your, your solution? Yes, we do. And I agree. Um, one of the reasons that people uh, get very frustrated with reconciliation is because they find that some of the data is unreliable. And um, it's really hard to measure the mining value chain. It's a rough environment. Um, uh, so that shouldn't stop you though, because even, even poor data can reveal trends and point you in the right direction. You can build in easy validation steps, you know, you don't want a production figure that's negative, for example, and simple stuff like that, we can build in easily, uh, depending what the customer can identify as a valid validation, so to speak. We've got a question actually from, uh, from one of the presenters, Chris, to you, Heath. So Chris, uh, kick off. Hi, Heath. Uh, the, the resource reconciliation is something that we're very interested in at the moment, actually, uh, because we get to see exactly how accurately the geological controls are with respect to the material coming out of the mine. And actually at the Ozim pre-concentration event later on in this year, I'll be presenting a paper on that. Uh, it's quite wild how far off uh, estimates are, actually. Uh, but we produce a really vast amount of data constantly from, from the sensor. Uh, how, how do you think that very large amount of data might integrate with the existing architecture that you have to be able to carry out that reconciliation process either in an automated or at least a less hands-on kind of a way? This is a really interesting question, Chris, thanks. And there's two parts to it. So current practice, most people will Heath um, may have some internet technical difficulties. We might have to it's a, it's a gather information over time. time and then so, sorry about that. I'm, I'm living out in the bush outside Perth, so uh, I'm a bit far away. Uh, but I was just saying, you know, most people will sum data over a period, usually a month. But I think the challenge going forward is to get that down to weeks and days. Um, you know, because I agree with you that a higher resolution of information and a faster learning loop will create much more value. Thanks for that, Heath. Um, we might move on to our next presenter and then keep any other questions for the end there. Um, our last presenter is uh, Brenton Crawford from Solve uh, Geo Solutions. Thanks, Shereen. Thanks for um, inviting me along today to, to speak. Uh, my name is Brenton Crawford uh, and I'm a geoscientist with Solve Geo Solutions. Um, Solve's a data science consultancy based in Melbourne, started in uh, 2015. And uh, the Solve team has uh, about you know, 10, 15 members at the moment. And we all have backgrounds in geoscience, computer science, engineering, uh, mathematics, and computer vision. Uh, as a consultancy, we work widely across most of uh, exploration and mining chain. But today, I'm going to talk to you guys about geometallurgy. Um, geometallurgy is one of the most fundamental fields that's really critical to improving efficiency, sustainability, uh, and profitability in, in mining operations. Um, and today I'm going to really talk about how Solve applies machine learning and data science tools to improve geometallurgical modeling outcomes 
um, to really you know, imp improve the, the, the way that, that our clients can mine. So we've had some talks about uh, ore processing and ore sorting um, sort of at that sort of later stages, but um, I'm going to be talking more about how we can get the best modeling um, for the rocks as they are in the ground um, uh, with, with, with as many data sets integrated as we can. So there's a technical definition of geometallurgy on the screen here, but um, probably just going to kind of summarize that by, by saying that with Geomet, what we're trying to do are build models that unify our knowledge on the material properties of the rocks um, and, and as they move through each step of the, of the processing um, cycle. So the two key challenges with building a good Geomet model, first of all, we've got to bring together a very large number of disparate data sets. Uh, and then we've got to try to understand all their complex interactions um, uh, for those various outcomes. So um, one of the reasons it's really challenging to bring all these input data sets together and understand that interaction is because they, they vary quite widely in terms of the resolution, coverage and consistency. So if we take things like um, continuous data, um, we have geophysics, uh, we may have composited data such as geochemistry, uh, and then we've got this high value, really high value data sets like quantified mineralogy, hardness and recovery data that are, that are quite sparsely collected um, and, and quite expensive as well. So Solv uses various data science techniques to, to deal with these issues uh, and create GMAT model, model um, domain models that um, describe really important characteristics of the ore body, things such as processing risk, uh, the ore types, with the geochemical mains, domains and the like. And this is going to guide the way the ore body is mined and, and processed potentially for a significant, significant period of time. Next slide, please. So let's focus on a few specific applications. Um, in, in our first example, we've got some, in the early stages of, of our modeling, one of the really critical first steps is to take the right samples in the right locations to maximize the value of each sample. We can use things like dimensionality reduction techniques to allow us to, to plot the multivariate similarity of samples in two dimensions or even three dimensions so we can interrogate them. So the plot we're seeing in the top left here shows several thousand data points um, uh, created using geochemistry and mineralogy um, that have then been clustered into domains the coarse dots are where metallurgical samples have been taken. And using this type of technique, we can see that there are domains that are poorly characterized by the current MET sampling. Um, and so we can guide that further sampling and, and understand deficiencies in, in where those expensive metallurgical samples have been collected, for instance. Um, there's obviously lots of other applications of this type of technique. If you go to example two, it's in the bottom left. Um, when we have data sets that are really expensive and often sparsely distributed, things like hardness test data, we may be able to predict them using data sets that are cheaper or have better coverage. So in this case, what we're doing is we're predicting rock hardness using mineralogical information. So the plot we have here is a downhole plot that shows depth versus hardness. Uh, red is the measured hardness data. Uh, that's measured at quite an expense and, um, and quite time consuming. And blue is the hardness model prediction where um, we have used the machine learning model to predict the hardness using other data sets. So this, is, this model is allowing us to extend hardness data into areas where it wasn't originally measured, or the rock may not, no longer exist to be measured in, in other more manual ways. In the final example, uh, we're going to look at um, how we can use things like core imagery to provide textual information for our GMET model. So the image at the bottom uh, is showing us around 20,000 um, square image patch um, tiles. Um, that are being displayed in what we call image similarity space. But images that plot together are actually visually similar. We can use this technique and techniques like it to build domains that are based on image texture that can then be fed back into GMET models. And then after we've done that level of modeling, we can go into individual images and extract further information through processes like image segmentation. Um, things we can segment um, include veins, sulfides, or any other visually distinct feature uh, in, in, that, in that imagery. Then we can generate various statistics that, that can, can further um, improve our understanding. Uh, in the example at the top here, we're segmenting a chalcopyrite vein using computer vision technique called instant segmentation. And this then allows us to better understand the distribution of those ore bearing minerals, which, which can then be related back to geochemistry and provide a more complete picture of mineralization. So these are, I guess, just a couple of snapshots of the way um, machine learning and, and data science in general can be used to improve GMET outcomes. And uh, I think I'll leave it there. Thanks for listening. And um, just a very brief, <laughs> brief summary of how we use uh, machine learning and, and data science to improve our GMAT outcomes for our clients. Thank you. Thanks, Brenton. Andrew, do we have a question for, from Brenton from you? I've got a few. We have time, but uh, I'll start yeah, sure. with one. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for that, Brenton. Um, 
a lot to cover in a short space of time, so I feel for you. Yeah. Um, I guess my first question is about um, the way um, people adopt your technology. Um, I, I imagine that a, a large cross-section of mining professionals would be dis distrustful of, of your solution because it appears to be a black box. Can you describe a profile of a company where you've had success and then also a profile of a company where you don't get success? Yeah, um, it's a great question. I think um, from, from our experience over the last five years, the companies that really value good data collection, especially early in their operation, um, are often the ones that succeed in these types of um, sort of techniques. Um, it's very difficult to, to go back and fix the problems of the past when it comes to data collection and, and um, and uh, so I think that the biggest driver of what makes a successful client versus an unsuccessful client client is actually often decisions they made five years ago um, about what kinds of data they were collecting at their, at their mine. Um, to address your comment about, I guess, the black box, um, I, I agree that there is a, an image problem with, with machine learning in particular, that it's a, you know, the, the magic black box data goes in and answers come out. Um, so we do a lot of work in, in sort of education, running um, courses to try to educate our clients about what it is we're actually doing with their data, um, and, and 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 because that's the last the black box solution is, is a poor solution in most in most cases. So, and probably the last point I'd make is that you know um, there's not really a product here for a lot of this stuff. Every client wants something very different. Data sets are different. The ore body's different. So what we do is supply people who are really good at looking at data and 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 you know creating good outcomes for clients. So. Um, it's, it's, I wish there was a product that could be built in this space to, for, for this, but everybody wants something so, so different, it's, it's quite difficult. So, yeah, thanks for the question. Oh, I want to get a bit technical for a moment here. Um, sure. <laughs> so standard unsupervised machine learning algorithms don't take into account the spatial aspect, which is important for us from a geological point of view, such as connectedness or correlation between the data points. How do you approach this problem? Um, when classifying data with a view to building mineralogical or geometeorological domains? Yeah, so it's probably one of, you feel the nail on the head, it's probably one of the really difficult um, aspects of, of geoscience, the spatial nature of data. Things like spatial autocorrelation uh, when you're building models is, is one of the most challenging um, things to deal with. Um, it's a complicated question. I, I would probably suffice to say that um, sometimes it's really important not to include spatial information in your data because you need your spatial coherent domains to hang together for reasons that have nothing to do that, that with them being next to each other or in some sort of spatial arrangement. So one of the best ways we have to work out whether we have good domains that make sense is to not include spatial information and see if they hang together spatially and are spatially coherent. Um, there are lots of things that, that can be done in terms of including um, you know, uh, interpolants from leapfrog or, or, or other things that you need, you know, you need to have in your model to understand what's happening between drill holes. Um, I'm probably not an expert in that enough to answer all of those um, particular questions, but um, yeah, suffice to say that um, the spatial nature of geological data is, is definitely a challenge um, and uh, something that there's no one good solution for it. Really depends on the outcome, I guess, you're looking for and what data you have going in. Hopefully that sort of answers your question. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Basically, there's not really a good answer yet. Yeah. <laughs> what we might do now, Andrew, um, Brenton, and, and, and the team is actually um, get uh, some feedback on, on the five Mets company. So obviously, thank you very much to all five of you for giving us an overview. And I know it's a short overview and a short period of time to present. But the whole idea is to stimulate thought around it and for people to connect with you after. I've already been asked for email addresses. Um, so you, you'll be getting contacted. Diego, um, we'll kick off with you. Do you have any comments about um, any of the five METS companies and, and uh, your thoughts on how these um, companies might be able to help you with your problem and, and challenge there at Haldeman? Well, first of all, I, I would like to thank to everyone for their presentations. They were just amazing. Uh, I don't know how you managed in, in such a short period of, period of time to put everything together. And the, the, about the, the, the products, uh, in fact, the, there is one that we already use. Uh, we, we already use the, the leapfrog uh, solution from Sequent. And the, I don't know much about geology, but our geologists, they love that. So uh, I, I, I can only speak good things about that. And okay. uh, I, I, I also found it very interesting and, and, and very applicable to our problem 
the, the two companies that uh, spoke about uh, sorting solutions. Uh, we understand that, that the particle uh, sorting is uh, something that uh, might be interesting now, but it will not solve the issues that we will have in the next 10 years. Uh, we, we understand that uh, there are some companies, uh, even, even at least one in Chile, that is trying uh, uh, that kind of technology. And um, we understand also that image-based uh, uh, technologies, technology, which is the one that we are using, is only applicable to, to a very narrow spectrum of the, the actual problem. So we fully understand that we have to go for, for bulk uh, sorting and uh, for something different than uh, image processing. So uh, I really appreciate, uh, appreciated the, the, the presentation from Chris and from David. I, I just found it, uh, I mean, really interesting. I would like to, 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 uh, I don't, to do some follow, follow up on that. And the, the, for, from the last two presentations, I also found them really interesting, uh, not, not completely, uh, I would say, applicable to the actual challenge that I presented, but uh, uh, very, very applicable to, to, diff, uh, to, to other uh, issues that we are finding in, in our sites. So, uh, I mean, I, I, everything was really interesting. Uh, some of the presentations more applicable to, to the actual problem uh, I presented here, but uh, uh, I really loved it. All of it. So thank you so much. Sounds like you'll be d busy, Diego, um, fielding some uh, some questions from from Chris and David to follow up. And I'm um, great to hear that you obviously use Sequent. Um, Natalia's role obviously is to help connect um, yourself and, and and these Mets companies. Um, Natalia, do you have any comment on on helping that connection? Um, absolutely. This is a big thank you to all the presenters. Um, this was certainly a um, educational experience for me. I understand um, the challenge and the solutions much clearer. Um, Diego, I think this gave you a very good overview of some of the solutions that you can find um, in Australia. Um, and I'd be very keen to, to continue working with you to help showcase um, what else we might be able to find to help you solve um, your and Haldeman's challenges. Um, I was very pleased to hear that there are other Latin American mines uh, listening in, so it was great to see you. Um, and the invitation goes out to all of the other miners as well. Um, if we can help connect, uh, please do reach out to us. We can be very creative, happy to work with IMARC to put together similar, um, uh, similar activities like this um, and others. Uh, we're, we're here to help connect. And, and again, thank you very much to, to everybody who presented and to Diego uh, for presenting his challenge. Excellent. Thanks, Natalia. Andrew, we'll, we'll finish off with yourself with any comments for the METS companies and, and your thoughts on, on the um, solutions. Thanks, Shireen. Yeah, I, I guess uh, I agree with you, Diego, that some of the um, presentations were much more applicable to your immediate problems, but uh, other solutions are probably going to be more useful to you downstream. Um, all of the presentations were excellent, and I'm going to do a bit more research myself into, into what was presented today. Um, in terms of the, the most useful one for you right now, Diego, it seems like Nextdoor might be the, the winner from my point of view. As always, though, some, there's, never a, there, yeah. there's no winners and losers here, obviously, everyone. <laughs> uh, is, and yes. all five METS companies were obviously chosen because um, they have solutions that can meet um, you know, several different companies. Um, Things, but obviously, yeah, it does sound like there's a lot of interest for Nextdoor, and there always has been every time um, Nextdoor does talk about um, their solution. But it sounds like Southern Innovation has something um, very similar, or otherwise that can compete or otherwise collaborate um, with Nextdoor, I'm sure, in, in the future. Um, and maybe that's what it's all about. It's about innovation, sustainability and collaboration, and I think um, all these companies show how they do that. I know the K2 Fly does some amazing things around ESG, etc. Um, look, I always say that these episodes are meant to go for an hour, but they always clock off at about 10 minutes after the hour. Um, I appreciate you all being uh, here with us this morning. Uh, for, for those of you in Australia, there's some that have joined us from Canada. Uh, I see Rizal, uh, Rizal there, um, and a number of you that have joined us from South America, Latin America. Uh, Diego, Natalia, thank you for staying up with us. Um, hopefully you have an amazing evening uh, for the rest of your time and don't go to sleep.
you know, thinking too much about <laughs> um, the, the, the challenge or the solutions and, uh, and come back to us tomorrow to be able to um, hook you up with some of these, uh, these amazing speakers and solutions. Heath, Steve, um, Chris, uh, Brenton and David, thank you very much for uh, your presentations. Um, Andrew and Natalia are fantastic hosts as always and we look forward to working with both Mining Class and Global Victoria and, uh, and the departments further. So thank you all for joining us and um, the next episode is next month and the topic is around planning, um, specifically around underground mining and non-entry. So we've got an exciting possible speaker coming in from Newcrest uh, on that episode and also some fantastic five METS companies that will be pre-selected for that particular opportunity as well. So thank you again and uh, have a great evening or day uh, to all of you.